Okay, we are live. Hello, my name is Rylan Warner. I'm an associate here at Joseph and Hall. I'm joined here by Luke Nearman. Hello, Luke. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today, Luke? Doing great. Good. You ready to give Good. some people some updates in the world of immigration? Yes, sure am. Yep. Sure. Do you want to get us started with your topic yeah. today? Yeah, so I was just going to chat, give a, give a quick update on DACA. So um, yesterday, June 15th, it actually marked the 10 year anniversary of the, the beginning of the DACA program. So DACA, that's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, it was a program started under the Obama administration and it provides um, temporary, kind of a temporary reprieve from removal from the United States for um, young kids who are brought to the United States. There are certain requirements that have to be met, but you know, by and large, it benefits young kids who were brought um, to the U.S. when they were when they were kids. Um, so that started in 2012, and so I just wanted to give a quick kind of rundown um, of, of the past 10 years, and then and then where we're at right now with DACA. Um, a lot has happened, so I'm not going to cover every single thing, um, but a couple a couple of the big highlights. So, so it starts in June 2012. Um, <clears throat> lots of people are super excited about this. Um, you know, it provided a way for a lot of kids who are here with no legal status um, <clears throat> to get uh, an employment authorization document, which allows them to work. Um, just opens up a lot of opportunities for people. So fast forward 10 years, 2017, uh, the, under the Trump administration, they, they rescinded that um, the memorandum that was issued in 2012 that initiated DACA, and they announced that they were going to wind down the program. Um, they said that initial requests for DACA, so people who had never had DACA before, they were no longer going to accept those, but they would continue to accept um, renewal applications for a short period. Um, but then shortly thereafter, a federal court intervened in response to some lawsuits and they said, um, you know, fine, we can we can halt the, the acceptance of new applications. But for all those uh, people who currently have DACA, like you have to continue to renew their DACA. They've been relying on this. And so, uh, 2017, new applications stop, uh, but renewals continue. Uh, this continues to be battled out in the courts. And then a couple years later, December of 2020, another federal court says that actually uh, the USCIS, they, they need to accept these initial requests for DACA. So we had this like three year period where they weren't accepting um, initial requests. Then December 2020, um, they started to accept initial requests as, uh, along with the renewals. A couple of years later, there's still lots of legal challenges. Uh, there's a, a court, a federal court in Texas, um, where the judge finds in his ruling that the, the establishment of this DACA program was illegal, and he um, halted USCIS from accepting any initial requests. So as of July 2021, USCIS, well, actually, let me rephrase, they could accept those initial requests, but they they couldn't actually issue any decisions on them. And so any initial requests for DACA that were pending as of mid-July 2021, they've just been in limbo since then. Um, and anyone who has filed a new request since July 2020 or, you know, you're, you get a receipt notice and, and USCIS will take your money for the application, but it's just being held in limbo. But um, they continue to accept renewal applications. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at right now. So people who already have DACA or if they had DACA, but it expired within the past year, they can continue to submit uh, a renewal application. Um, but anyone who has never had DACA, um, right now you can still submit an application, but there's, there's not a lot of benefit in doing that because USCIS can't actually issue any decision on your application. So there's lots of folks who are just kind of stuck in limbo. Um, you know, at the same time, these lawsuits were, were uh, being 
fought out in, in court, um, the administration also proposed, um, it's called a, a rule, a regulation, um, to provide some more stability and permanence to the DACA program. So that, that rule has to go through this, this uh, bureaucratic process where the government proposes a rule, gives the public an opportunity to provide um, comments on that proposed rule. And then typically after that, uh, after that comment period ends, at some point the, the proposed rule will be finalized and will become a final rule, um, which just provides a lot more stability and protection um, for uh, various processes. So it docket in this case. So back in September of 2021, the government proposed uh, some new rules regarding DACA. Um, the public commented on that, that public, uh, that comment period closed. Uh, but since then, we're still waiting. So a lot of people anticipate that the government is going to come out with this final rule. Um, and what that means, you know, uh, it would just provide some more stability to the DACA program. So one of the challenges that lots of people, uh, states and and various entities have made in regards to this DACA program where they say it's illegal is because it was created just by executive action. So it didn't go through this whole process of um, publishing a, a rule, creating this program that people could weigh in on. Um, and so this aims to, to remedy that. So people are expecting this final rule to come out um, sometime. You know, we thought it would come out by now. Um, some people think it'll come out before um, the midterms, um, but we we will see. We're not sure. It could come anytime, but uh, yeah, we don't know. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at right now. Still, still a mess, uh, and it's still frustrating. You know, we've had DACA for ten years, um, and the hope was that this was just a stopgap measure. You know, that Congress in the meantime would establish some more um, permanent protections, pathway to the permanent residence and eventually citizenship for a lot of these kids. Um, but that unfortunately has not happened yet. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, DACA has great as it was 10 years ago as like a hopeful beacon. I mean, it's kind of been spinning its wheels and a lot of people misunderstand it and, and think, Oh, I'll get my green card. Uh, and it, right now it's not a route towards a green card it yeah. is a, a great form of security for the people that were able to get it uh but as you were just describing they've limited who can get it and, and now too i mean isn't one of the requirements for daca that you have been residing in the united states since 2007 or something like that so yeah. Yeah. we now have a whole it's 2022 we have a whole generation of children that are in a very similar situation as DACA holders were, but they don't meet that eligibility. Even if they were accepting new applications, they weren't alive in 2007. So right. uh, it's it's a narrow window and, and it's not leading towards a green card, but still the targets are set on it to try to get rid of it anyways, uh, despite how much it's helped people. Yeah. I know there was a story recently about how um, uh, the White House set a new record of having the first DACA recipient actually added to the administration. Uh, yeah. uh, someone was nominated, I think, to a position in HUD in the Housing and Urban Urban Development uh, Agency. I'm not entirely sure what committee, but it, she sounds like an awesome young lady. Uh, do you have her name by chance? Do you know it? I don't. Uh, it's yeah, we've had Nava or something like that. Uh, shout out to you. Yeah. I'm sorry for uh, misremembering <laughs> your name right now, but I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, these are people that are helping contribute to our society. They've been here since they were children. Uh, her name was Cindy Nava, uh, yeah. and she was, you know, a leader in uh, in Albuquerque, I think, in New Mexico. Um, and so that's why the Biden administration recognized her and decided to nominate her to a position. But uh, where are we on getting her an actual green card, guys? I I mean, she might have another route. I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. exactly what her immigration status is, but um, it's 
I, yeah, it's it's frustrating, and but hopefully good things, more good things come. We'll just have to wait and see about that. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's. We'll see, yeah. Sorry, what? Oh, that, yeah, that's it. Yeah. What? Uh, so, in some other, uh, to try to continue a hopeful trend here, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the Supreme Court announced today that they're not going to be taking up a. a, a a hearing a case uh, regarding states trying to sue about the repeal of the public charge rule that was implemented during the Trump uh, era. If you're not aware of what this rule was, I mean, uh, right now, people that apply for a green card, uh, they all need to submit at some point an affidavit of support. Uh, this is a, an affidavit, at least through a family-based petition. Uh, if For an affidavit of support, you need to have somebody that is willing to sponsor you and say that they will uh, keep you at at least 125% of the poverty level uh, and this is to prevent you from becoming a burden on the United States. Uh, so we have somebody already in the United States saying, hey, yeah, I vouch for them. I'll make sure that they're taken care of. Uh, and so they won't come in and just immediately need a ton of help. Um, uh, the Trump administration kind of broadened uh, this public charge idea, and they said, well, if anybody was already in the United States and they're now applying for a green card, if they had ever received basically any kind of public assistance from the government, that makes it very difficult for them to get a green card. Uh, that public assistance could have been food stamps, it could have been housing uh, vouchers for public housing, anything like that. Uh, it was Announced by the Trump administration, I think it was in place for around a year before a court enjoined it, uh, and and then it was just fought over in courts a lot, uh, and then finally when the Biden administration came into power, uh, they uh, just stopped fighting the court cases about it and let it just kind of go away and say there is no more uh, such such a strong public charge rule against people getting these types of government benefits. Uh, so this lawsuit uh, was brought by Arizona and a number of other states uh, saying, hey, the Biden administration isn't allowed to do that. They should have kept this rule. Why didn't they fight for it more? That's not fair. I this really this rule really affects me. Uh, Arizona was claiming um, that these types of um, cases where uh, green card holders uh, should be denied because they previously uh, accepted government benefits, uh, they were saying that this could cost them billions of dollars in state money. Um, I'm not entirely sure where they got that because the the Biden administration came back and said of the 50,000 applications that were submitted when this uh, rule was actually in place, the rule only affected five of them. Wow. Five of the 50,000. Five out of 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess each of them is taking $1 billion each oh. in terms of government assistance. I'm not sure. Um, but it's... Uh, Ultimately, the Supreme Court said, you know, we do kind of have some issues with how the Biden administration didn't really follow through on this rule, but we're not going to listen to this case. We're just going to deny it. So the this public charge rule is now dead for now. Um, it could always come back into place if we have another administration that wants to put it back into place. But for now, for at least the next two years, uh, we're, we're good on that. So that's, I know there's been a lot of talk about the Supreme Court and, uh, doing, making decisions that, uh, majority of the public don't agree with, but at least in this case, they were like, yeah, whatever. No, no public charge rule anymore. You're not required to keep enforcing that Biden administration. So it's a good sign, at least in one, <laughs> one aspect, but yeah, that's, that is my story for this week. All right. Do we have any questions today? Let's check. Let's check. <laughs> Uh, looks like we don't. So if anybody out there has any questions about immigration, we're here. Okay. And we could give you some broad overviews of any type of topic you want to talk about. If you have more specific questions, we'd be happy to schedule a consultation with you guys. Uh, but we are here for you. 
Uh, well, anything else you want to add, Luke, before we sign off? I think that's it. Yeah, we'll be here next Thursday. So yes, we will. Same time. More questions. Same time. Come on Thursday and ask your questions. Yeah, I like uh, whatever your lighting is going on. It looks like kind of like you're in a waterfall. So <laughs> you keep that waterfall effect uh, going. I think it's, it's just the, the overhead lights. <laughs> <laughs> All Very right. Nice. Well, was good talking to you, Luke. Good talking to you, everybody out there. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Oh, we oh, got one. Oh, Tania, right in at the buzzer. Um, she says she has a green card that expired on May 4th, I'm guessing 2022. So, Tania, um, what – I mean, there's not really a question there. But if you need help in renewing your green card uh, through filing an I-90, uh, we would be happy to do so. Um, it's a good idea to have – to always have a, a valid form of your lawful permanent residence on you, a, a proof of your lawful permanent residence on you. Uh, not having one can lead to a fine. It can even lead to you being uh, jailed. It, there, there could be some severe penalties for not having your proof of status. So, yeah, if you want to reach out to us, Tania, uh, and we could help you with. Uh... Oh, okay, okay. Here's the actual question. Okay, uh, she's asking. She's applied for a new one, but can she leave the country while her uh, green card application renewal is pending? What do you think about that, Luke? Yeah, I mean, we'd have to maybe talk about specifics of your case, but in general, when you apply to renew your green card, the receipt notice that you get, right on that receipt notice, it says that if that that is evidence that you're um, of your lawful permanent residence status for another twelve months from the date of expiration on your green card. So, yeah, typically with that receipt notice, then along with your expired green card, you shouldn't have any problems traveling. Yeah, yeah. So make sure that you're bringing those documents with you when you're traveling in case CBP wants to look at those. Uh, but yeah, you should be okay in general. We don't, like Luke said, we don't know the specifics of your case. Uh, oh, now we have another follow up from Tania. Uh, she says the receipt notice is now expired. So what I would try to do then, Tania, I, I and just in general, uh, if you don't have proof of your status, but you're waiting for uh, for something to happen, you've already submitted an I-90 uh, and your receipt notice has now expired, I would schedule an info pass appointment with your local USCIS office. Uh, and then you should be able to go in there, talk to them, say, hey, I, I filed this. I just need continued proof of my status. And they should be able to put a little stamp in your passport to show that you still have valid status uh, and that you're just waiting for your I-90 uh, to be approved. Um, that, that, I mean, that does make it a little bit riskier traveling because uh, you never know with a CBP officer what they've encountered before. Um, and so, so just know that there is an incredible, increased risk traveling with just that stamp but definitely go get that stamp before you try traveling okay did i did i get it there luke was that good yeah yeah okay okay all right, all right. well thanks for writing in to me yeah. <laughs> uh and if you have any other questions we'll be here next week bye everybody bye